So friends, it is the duty of our master convener, Dr. D.P. Bhusan, to start the meeting. Dr. D.P. Bhusan, please. Yes. You hand it over to me after your opening sentences, and maybe then I can do it. Good afternoon, everybody. Mm. Uh, now it is our right privilege to have Dr. Ramesh Sain, and under his leadership, we had been doing a great job here. We had this is our third meeting, and the subject is crystal arthropathy. We are very much delighted that this time, with the suggestions of Dr. Uh, Ramesh Sain, we have included the surgical things also in this for which uh, a couple of speakers will be speaking. So now I'll request our uh, uh, subject expert, Dr. S.S. Jha to hand over her mic to Dr. Ramesh Sain, who should welcome us all. And we feel honored to have him on the this Zoom meeting straight from the Ho Chi Minh city. And obviously, one of the seven wonders of the world, oh, yeah. natural wonders of the world, he must have seen. Kya Ramesh sahab, you have seen it? <laughs> Surely uh, going around, yeah. Right. So, so <laughs> friends, uh, Dr. Neeraj, are you there still? Do Dr. Neeraj? I'm very much here, yes, sir. Okay. Something has gone wrong with my presentation, uh, with my whole presentation. So I cannot stop share. So can you do it from your end? No, sharing is done, sir. Your screen is not on, sir. Yes, sir. Your sharing is not on, sir. My? Press escape, press ESC button. Uh, ESC button. Escape button, escape. Right, I understand where it is. Left side, yes, right, sir. Right. Left side, upper corner. Left top up. Right. Now I will share. Right. Now you are sharing the screen, sir. All right. So, friends, good evening, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to this IOA 22 Orthopedic Rheumatology Master Class Webinar 3. The topic of this evening's talk is to get on to realities regarding gout and related crystal arthropathies. Well, without wasting any time, it's our proud privilege that our very own president, Professor Ramesh Kumar Sain, is sitting from a far off country, Vietnam, and he is ready to have, it, have the inaugural address. May I have the inaugural address, please, from you. Good evening, friends. I'm really delighted that our Committee on Rheumatology has proved it. They are the first to start and definitely going on a path which is much beyond anything. And credit goes to Dr. Jha, to Dr. Bhoshan to have coordinated all these meetings so beautifully. And the aim of having this specific group is fully being maintained, rather over maintained with the punctuality, with the subject selection, everything seems to be going perfectly. And I really congratulate these two people to have come. There is some break in, connection issue yeah. in the yes. So it does not matter. He has opened his heart and now it is the turn of our very uh, dynamic secretary IOA, Dr. Naveen Thakkar, for his opening remarks as he has always been doing. Dr. Thakkar, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So right. at the IOA office, we welcome you all for this webinar and uh, this committee is working very hard. It was, it, it was working last year also very hard and they are very punctual. 
it is the only committee which also does the rehearsal before uh, doing real webinar so we are thankful to the all faculty dr s s jha sir dr bhushan sir and all the faculty who are going to contribute in this and all members are waiting for the academic part of this so i will not take much time sir please go ahead with the academic content thank you right. sir right thank you thank you for all the encouraging words so friends today we are going to talk about gout and related crystal arthropathies well crystal arthropathies is not only gout so what are the responsible crystals in synovial fluid taken out from a joint it is in case of gout monosodium urate monohydrate calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate which is pseudo gout calcium oxalate crystals and the other uncommon ones are cholesterol crystals steroid crystals even talc particles and lipid droplets are responsible for crystal arthropathies at some unusual places so what is so very clear about gout i must admit that though various kinds of treatments are available but the status of management is such that we usually only sub optimally optimally treat our patients despite availability of effective and safe urate lowering therapies most common inflammatory arthritis all of us know that rheumatoid arthritis is only 1% of the population here it is almost up to 2% of adult population with chronic hyperuricemia leading to intra articular deposition of msu crystals friends any learning process there has to be relearning after unlearning so available therapies for gout effectively practice evidence based medicine and let us discard myths related to urate lowering therapy regarding its dose and rare associated complications it is not out of place to mention that very early during gout deposition of urate crystal in joints and tendon is a highlight and an important outcome in gout is an ultimate trophy formation in gout treatment what is the aim urate crystal de deposits have to be resolved by a treat to target we al always say t to t approach before they produce any radiological footprint here it will not be out of place to mention that it is almost equivalent to rheumatoid arthritis where radiographic damage is a matter of concern so here too in gout it should not produce radiological footprint well friends just in the introductory part i must mention that cardiovascular outcomes are more frequent in several inflammatory rheumatic conditions so gout is no exception and frequently have cardiovascular and renal comorbidities main causal factors of primary gout are nutrition and genetic polymorphisms we shall be talking about it later for the time being we have changed changed the order and now i would like dr neeraj to make a presentation on behalf of dr ss amarnath who because of some urgent reasons have not been able to be here Uh, dr neeraj will you make the presentation of dr amarnath neeraj are you there rishi yes sir i am here okay please so uh, dr neeraj is making that presentation video presentation of dr amarnath yes it is regarding investigations in gout so dr amarnath starts his talk there are 
initial few slides which are only representative of what dr amarnath wants to say yes video is not working yes initial few slides the sound is not there yes you can skip initial 1 2 3 slides or let let them come as the yes 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 right and give full volume after this crystal arthropathy investigation this is what is talk is right move crystal arthropathy investigations the purpose is diagnose and differentiate between all the crystals that we have just mentioned next please any sound has still not come next next right i think the sound is coming you can go next yes so till dr amarnath sound is coming yes please uh the pathology definitely includes inflammatory blood markers synovial fluid analysis 24 hour urine collection radiographic and these are the crystal arthropathy investigations blood has cbc plus esr liver function and renal function test with crp ra factor anti ccp ana hb a1 c yes the volume could be louder any times you may also i tell you better dr jha sir okay I, i i i'm going ahead so yes, fasting yes. blood sugar postprandial thyroid procalcitonin and parathormone also has to be studied next next yes for a surgical you know intervention which may not be called for at all so that's very important for us to make sure that we differentiate infection hence the procalcitonin as well is part of our infection program now yeah when once you get the blood tests in hand you know the blood tests are going to be either false positive positive false negative or negative very confusing right so we need to be very clear and understand the parameter the levels and how to differentiate those and interpret that's very important now when once the blood is done obviously we would like to Know, we compress the joint, which is very painful. One can be very painful, and uh, because not just the crystal or the pathy kind of thing, but the joint is so uh, swollen, uh, effusion is so much, we need to, you know, decompress it for the function of the joint to be happening. At the same time, you when you draw the uh, you know a fluid from the synovial fluid from the joint, it could be any of the peripheral joints, and is pretty accessible. See the quantity color quality is there anything else that been mixed and physical examination as well as the microscopic analysis and the chemical analysis has to be made so i'm not going to touch each on that because there are other colleagues of mine who have covered that aspect what we are looking at is under the photo like micro light microscopic electron microscopy we need to pick up the crystals here The crystals are here, and then here is the phagocyte which has swallowed the crystal, and then we can identify that. So that's very important. And when you're doing polarized light microscopy, we could see the illuminance of these crystals. And in a transmission electron microscopy, we can also see the crystals in a very big way, in lightning fashion. You know. So the next one would be the X-ray. X-ray very important. Ultrasonography and dual energy CT scans are the newcomers in the musculoskeletal assessment of the rheumatology and rheumatoid kind of conditions. 
Here, I'm going to take a close-up picture from the toe. Here, the toe fungi has eaten away the bone, the cortex and getting into the medulla. And then here, you see this in the periarticular region and leaving the joint almost free, but very painful. And here, the toe fungi, which is very aggressive, involve the joint as well as the soft tissue shadow which can be picked up in a big way. Here you're seeing the calcified arthritis or calcification arthritis or Milwaukee kind of a thing, or it could be any of those conditions. So now we need to pick it up. Sometimes it could be very early and this can be seen in a diffraction with uh, synchrotron, which is very available in a few centers in the country. Now, cytophosphate arthropathy or crystalline arthropathy can be coexisting in other autoimmune conditions and rheumatoid is not left behind. You need to understand, see how the second metacarpal phalangeal joint of the index finger is affected in a big way in a rheumatoid hand. Hip is not spared as well. So you need to be very clear on that. Here you see the cartilage joint and the capsule, everything is getting you know, calcified in the chondrome calcinosis of the joint here. Ultrasonography is very important, which is done by a trained and experienced hand and an eye because they need to interpret as well, not just picking up the images. Classical dual track or double track can be seen in here, like a regular track, the cortex. Here, the bone as well as the cartilages are seen to have the deposits of the calcified uh, structures or the uh, you know crystals deposits happening there. Now, the next one which is very important is dual energy CT scans have been used in a cardiac uh, you know in a big way for more than uh, two decades now. But the musculoskeletal extension has been made only in the recent past one because of the demand and the expertise. Almost all the centers in the Tier 1, Tier 2 cities have this facility. I think we should use it and make sure that the patients are getting good relief from this. This is a second view or different kind of a monosodium urate. It could be any of those crystals coming in. So it will be very, very easily picked up and it's not very expensive to get them done anyway. So with that in mind, I would recommend each uh, one of you to uh, understand that this is very important. Make sure that you are uh, investigating them a part of clinical examination early. Make sure that it is investigated early so that they can treat them early. With this short talk of uh, investigations in arthropathy, which can take a whole day to examine, talk, and give, is comprised in a bird's eye view in eight to nine, nine minutes. Thank you, folks. I thank Indian Orthopedic Association and Rheumatology Subcommittee to give this opportunity to educate each one of you and learn to each other. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dr. Deeraj, for making, getting this presentation done. Now, uh, as in the program, I would like, let me share this screen. So main casual factors of primary gout are number one, nutrition and genetic polymorphisms, which are X-linked traits of renal transporters of urate. Men present with early onset gout, think of some genetic condition when the age is below 25 years. High incidence of uric acid nephrolithiasis can be seen at this age. Now, I would like Professor Pandak Bhusan to talk about genetics and gout, and he will be having some tongue twisting names. So now. Am I Professor sharing my Pan screen? Pandak Bhusan, yes, please do it. My screen is there? Uh, not yet. I have shared content the screen, right? Broadcast. Microphone is on. Right, sir? Is it okay now? 
no, no. Anybody can see? I cannot see. DP Bhushan, please. Not visible. Not visible. I am just touching the share content. Then I have touched the screen. The screen broadcast. Start. Zoom start broadcast. Sir, yes. your video is not showing. Is it okay, sir, now? Video is not coming. The video... Now, now it will come. Now, now it will come. It is probably from the iPad. That's why. Right. Yes, Purin Salvage, we can see. Yes, sir. Right. Go back to... Yes. So, genetics and Lish Nyhan syndrome. Am I visible, sir? Right. And audible too. Yes, go ahead. So, uh, we should understand that purine comes from two sources. Endogenous and exogenous. And in endogenous, we have de novo synthesis and one is purine salvage. So, in purine salvage, as you can see, the RNA or DNA, once they break to the purine, this purine with adenosine deaminases, this adenosine is converted to inosine and then xanthine and hypoxanthine. Purine can straightway come to the xanthine and hypoxanthine. Now, this hypoxanthine and xanthine is getting accumulated in the body. So this is again converted to the purine by the HGPRT enzyme. As you can see, it, it is again another graphic representation of the same thing. So, Leshnihan syndrome was first described at John Hopkins Hospital in 1964 by two friends, Michael Lish and William Nyhan, in two brothers with an unusual set of symptoms. Both brothers presented severe retardation of motor development acetosis, dystonia, crystal in the urine, the orange sand, later determined to be composed of uric acid, and most striking, the self-mutilation. That is described in 1964 by Lesh and Nihan. As you can see, the urine, that orange sand, crystals, as S.S. Samarnath has shown already, and the stone. One is mental retardation. While the salvage pathway is not working, then there is accumulation of some of the waste products and that go and attack the basal ganglia. And this basal ganglia affection can lead to a mental retardation, which as you can see, the child or the developing child or the adult has to be tied to the bed or the wheelchair, or to the crib. With the stimulation of the basal ganglia, they develop anger. And with this anger, when it is not manifested or not checked, if it is unchecked, then there is a tendency of self-mutilation. The mutilating things they have is, is their main teeth. As you can see in the pictures, the mutilation is there in the nails. They keep on whitening the nails. To the extent, in one photo, you can see that he has bitten his finger. They bite their lips, their gums, and even they mutilate their face. So, from 1964 to 2005, almost 50 years later, Majoring HGPRT activity in erythrocytes remain the gold standard for the diagnosis of flesh Nyhan syndrome. As you can see, there is a ischemic timeline. This timeline has said when the first case was detected and how it has progressed. If you can see different years, I don't think I should go into the detail how. Lesh Nyhan has progressed, though I have read it into the detail. 
it is an interesting story but today lesh nyhan syndrome which is an x linked recessive disorder x linked recessive disorder just like uh, ups to can paralysis just like color blindness just like hemophilia this particular disorder is affecting only the male boys and the females are carrier genetic and environmental factors are juxtaposed with the two major mechanism that leads to hyperuricemia exogenous and endogenous now once in 1998 they have found a gene for lesh nyhan syndrome and as you can see they have been adding definite genes for this so there are many genetic factors many genes discovered year by year from 1998 to 2011 the genes are getting piled up so many genes are affecting the uric acid metabolism the genetic has developed a lot and now the time has come that we feel that we need some gene therapy or genetic intervention to control it the uric acid transportasome i think uh, the others will talk about it more but because at different levels where there is a problem the treatment changes urate transporters are real proximal tubules they are involved in the secretion and reabsorption of urate the balance between these processes determine the net proximal renal excretions this is again they are definite different and myriads of genes which are enumerated here so the salvage pathway of urine the adenosine taking the prp prp say PRP से इन्होंने लिया फॉस्फेट एंड द ओनली फॉस्फेट रिमेन्स यार एंड AMP इज मेड गोनिन द GMP इज मेड बट फॉर गोनिन एंड हाइपोजैंथिन वी नीड HGPRT हाइपोजैंथिन गोनिन फास्फोराइबोसिल ट्रांसफरेज एंड इफ दिस इज समहाउ डेफिशिएंट देन दिस GMP इज नॉट फॉर्म and if this gmp is not formed these adenosine guanine are accumulated gmp goes and hits directly the basal ganglia and the problem occurs so coming there by again the leshne hand syndrome if it is a child of 10 to 12 years having hyperuricemia and uricosuria and if the patient is having self mutilation anger behavior mental retardation we are definitely dealing with lesh nyhan syndrome many other genetic problems are there as i have mentioned you in the genes and the genetic things are to be understood one has to understand that somebody is the uric producers uric acid producers or not i routinely after this uh, sub committee has started initially i used to get the uric acid done now i am getting 24 hours uric acid measurement also today only i got a person who has 880 it should be 800 mg per liter thank you very much sir stop sharing the screen it has been a very good presentation Have you stopped, sir? Right. It has been. This will stop. Other screen sharing. What did I say? Right. Right, sir. It was nice, but uh, sometimes the voice was breaking. Mine, sir. I don't know. It might be my problem here. No, sir. You are never at problem. <laughs> <laughs> No, okay no, no. You, can you somebody help me this very slide nice, uh, my slide is not given. moving yeah my slide is not moving can somebody help me sir just click once on the slide and then go it will take 
Okay. Just click once on the slide and then next. Yes. So yeah. we had this talk on genetics and gout from Professor Panak Bhusan, who is the convener and professor and head of department orthopedics, Sahid Nirmal Mahato Medical College, Dhanbad. Now is the term of another professor, but before that, Dr. Pannak has very successfully talked about uh, Lisnehan syndrome. There are two inherited enzyme abnormalities in urate biosynthesis pathway leading to urate overproduction. So just to repeat, overactivity of phosphoribosyl pyro pyrophosphate synthetase and number two, no, partial, de partial deficiency of hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase, which also has another tongue twisting name like yes, Kelly, Kelly Sigmiller syndrome. <laughs> I did not talk. And, <laughs> and <laughs> now there are two another facets that, as Dr. Pannak has said, complete HGPRT deficiency gives you le less Nehan syndrome. And with glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency, it has another tongue-twisting tongue name, von Gierke's mm -hmm. disease. What basically happens is accelerated ATP breakdown during hypoglycemia induced glycogen degradation. The another facet is hereditary fructose intolerance caused by fructose 1 phosphate aldolase deficiency. Here too, there is accelerated ATP catabolism. So, what pathogenic processes are responsible for development of hyperuricemia? They are increased end product of purine metabolism. So, Professor Abhay Ilhans, will, who is Professor and Head Orthopedics Ames Jodhpur, will be talking about etiopathogenesis of gout and will also touch upon various other related crystal arthropathies also. Professor Ilhans. Good evening, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Please, uh, let, others, let, make let, yourself let, mute so that it doesn't disturb. Please, others, please make uh, yourself mute. Can you see my screen, sir? Yes. It is the last one. Yeah, can you see it now? Right. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jha, sir, and thank you, IOA, for the opportunity. So my brief today is to talk of uh, etiopathogenesis of crystal arthropathies, uh, a disease entity which we understand as type 1 and type 2 uh, <clears throat> autoinflammatory disorders. So what is uh, what comprises crystal arthropathy? What is the mechanism which leads to this autoimmunity? And when we talk of the term auto, we essentially uh, talk of the fact that uh, this is a process of uh, auto-induction and expression of the IL-1 beta, the processing of IL-1 beta, and the secretion of IL-1 beta, which causes the autoimmunity. And once there is an expression, uh, one person, the disease spectrum, the clinical disease spectrum varies from uh, uh, asymptomatic hyperuricemia to uh, a destructive arthropathy. And that exactly is, there is no clear understanding as to what is the exact pathway in terms of ABCD, which is responsible for- a Your, your slides are not moving. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. okay. The next we need to touch upon the genetic predisposition and what are the factors that are affecting. Can somebody mute the slides? There's a lot of uh, noise around. Somebody is unmuted. So what is grout? Crystalline arthropathy as it manifests as a disorder with spontaneous onset, recurrent episodes, inflammasome mediated activation of IL-1 beta, and self-limitation and resolution. The dis disorder essentially leads to deposition of calcium crystals in tissues and urate crystals in tissues, 
the urate crystal mediated disorder is called gout, and the calcium crystals mediated disorder is called pseudogout, the BCP, and the calcium oxalate uh, arthropathy. So autoimmunity essentially involves three steps. One is the triggering phase, the other is the active phase, and third is the resolution phase. And the predominant factor is that there is a, a, a generation of uh, uh, pathogenic crystals. Can we, uh, can the uh, noise be muted, please? There is somebody talking in between. So the triggering phase essentially leads to crystal deposition. Can, can we mute everyone? The host can mute everyone, so the noise will not be there. So the triggering phase essentially involves deposition of the pathogenic crystals, and the deposition essentially leads to a crystal recognition by the myeloid cells, which is part of the triggering phase. And the innate immune system then tends, goes on, to, uh, uh, to activate the monocyte macrophage system, which leads to the active phase. The active phase essentially works through the NLRP3 activation and crystals induce the production of uh, interleukin-1 beta and the inflammatory mediators and the endogenous pyrogens. The beauty of this disorder is that it undergoes a self-limiting and a recurrent resolution phase. And this essentially is a function of the endogenous and the exogenous, uh, exogenous molecules, which function as the ramps. And the <laughs> Evolutionally, we understand that all mammals have an enzyme xanthine oxidase, which essentially is responsible for degradation of xanthine uh, to uric acid. What we don't have is the enzyme uricase, which converts the uric acid into allantoin, which is lacking in apes and humans. And the deficiency of uricase basically causes a comparatively higher uh, quantum of PCM uric acid uh, levels in humans, even in steady state conditions. Uh, somebody needs to mute the noise. So the regulation of uric acid in humans essentially is done by the kidney, the gut, and to some extent by the liver. And the concentration of more than 6.4 milligram per deciliter is often is, exceeds the solubilization limit of monosodium urate crystals in the tissues. Uh, Hold on, uh, Jasar is a co-host. He can mute uh, everybody. Sir, you can click on the participants and uh, mute everybody. Sir. Uh, Jasar, you can. Uh, your mic is off. You can just click on the participant and mute everybody. Meanwhile, okay. I'll try to talk to. Uh, Mute all. Also. Yes, mute all. But then our speaker will be muted. He, no, you he, please, he, ha, you please unmute. Abhay, you unmute yourself. Abhay, unmute yourself. Abhay, you have to unmute, please. Dr. Abhay, thanks. Yeah. Can you that? see me? Can you hear me now, sir? Yes, 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 yes. please, please. Okay. So the hyperuricemia mechanisms essentially involve uh, an excessive dietary purine intake or an increased endogenous purine production. To add to this is the decline in kidney function due to aging, disease, drugs, such as diuretics, aspirins, which cause and impairs the appropriate excretion of uric acid leading to crystal deposition. But what is important is that the clinical spectrum can vary from asymptomatic hyperuricemia to uh, destructive arthropathy. And in about 36% of, pat of patients only will develop gout. And not all gouty patients have hyperuricemia. 
On the other hand, 76% of these asymptomatic hyperuricemics do not have MSU crystal deposits in tissues. So only about half or 50% of the serum uric acid concentrations, more than 10 milligrams per DF, will clinically de develop gout during a 15 year period. So what is important is that there is no clearly defined mechanism as to when and in whom an imbalance will cause the precipitation of these attacks. Which is what brings us to another dimension of the pathogenesis, which is the immune mechanism. And that essentially cause is, involves three stages. One is formation of the MSU crystals. The second is an acute attack. And second is conversion to a chronic stobaceous gouty arthritis. The formation of the MSU crystals essentially involves the hyperuricemia, precipitation of MSU crystals, and deposition in articular and periarticular tissues. The acute attack, which is basically uh, involves the activation of the inflammasome and production of the cytokines with extensive activation of neutrophils, which we will just talk about. And once there is a formation of, when is, there is a necroptosis and formation of the uh, the, the aggregates of the, of the crystals, that will essentially lead to resolution of inflammation and formation of the gouty trophy. So the, with increasing amount of in an acute phase, with in, the first thing to, to happen in uh, an acute gouty attack is the formation is the deposition of MSU crystals leading to a sodium overload, which causes a water influx into the cell. As a result, causes the formation of a uh, an inflammasome due to swelling and release of the intra, uh, interleukin-1, which essentially is an activated form of an interleukin-1 pro-beta. And this, once there is a, a, a cytokine release, it causes an increased amount of neutrophils to be recruited into the site of the MSU deposits, causing a formation of the, uh, the cluster aggregates, which is called the agnets. And this happens usually in the later stages of a gouty arthritis, and when only a sufficient amount or a large amount of neutrophils have already been recruited. So the formation of aggregated nets is itself essentially a tipping point where active inflammation will now lead to the process of resolution and formation of a gouty tophi, wherein the body tries to contain the detrimental effects of crystal deposits and pack the MSU crystals along with extra-articular DNA in the form of uh, a gouty tophi. And this is the schematic representation of uh, the basic mechanism of uh, chronicity, where there is a neutrophil uh, crystal ingestion followed by uh, a neutrophil activation and necroptosis, and then formation of aggregates of neutrophilic extracellular traps or the uh, agnets. Now, the important thing is that the beauty of the formation of agnets, which leads to formation of chronic gout, is that it acts and traps uh, inflammatory cytokines within minutes. And then it prevents the degradation of further cytokines and removes the fuel for inflammation, and the process will gradually and, and quickly uh, collapse and die down. So an overview, essentially, there is a urate overproduction, which causes the purine degradation. And that can be because of a gut under secretion of urate, or could be a renal under excretion of uric acid. And this essentially causes a hyperuricemia, which leads to the formation and deposit of MSU crystals. This causes an inflammasome activation and an acute flare because of a cytokine called interleukin-1 beta. And once there is a neutrophil recruitment and endothelial activation, this leads to the formation of gouty tophi and resolution of inflammatory. Now, the various aspects of genetics which are involved with the gouty disorder is that there are specific proteins in the inflammasome which are genetically coated. And it has been found that there are certain population-specific genetic variants as well. But contrary to expectation, no metabolic comorbidity association has been found with hyperuricemia and gout. And the genetic variants specific to populations also predict their responsiveness to different kinds of therapy. So it has to be, as Dr. Jha said in his uh, initiation, that it has to be a T2T, a targeted therapy uh, system. And lastly, the uh, genetic wide associated study essentially identifies and tries to identify uh, based on a population data analysis uh, predominantly asymptomatic hyperuricemics and certain uncomic genetic variants. 
which brings us to another type of crystal arthropathy, which I'm not going to touch in detail because it will be covered by Dr. Ravi, is the calcium crystallopathy, which essentially involves the CPP and the BCP or the basic calcium phosphate and calcium oxalate crystal arthropathy. <coughs> the basic mechanism leads to a spectrum of uh, either an acute crystal arthritis, asymptomatic disease, or cross-chronic arthropathies. Whereas the basic calcium phosphate disorder can lead to certain, uh, certain basic disorders such as the calcific periarthritis, which Dr. <clears throat> Raja will cover, large joint destructive arthropathies, and some certain secondary forms. The process and the mechanism is pretty much similar to how uh, the immune-mediated damage happens in gout. And essentially, there is a familial align, uh, association with the CCAL1 and the CCAL2 in the 5P and the 8Q loci. The BCP, as will also be touched later, essentially involves uh, deposits of uh, partly carbon-substituted hydroxyapatite, but also osteocalcium phosphate, TCP, and magnesium vitlochite. And these are basically associated with calcific periarthritis, soft tissue calcifications, osteoarthritis, and even atherosclerosis, and sometimes breast cancer patients as well. The calcium oxalate crystal deposits is rare, occurs mostly in azotemic patients receiving hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, and particularly those treated with vitamin C, which is metabolized to oxalate. And these crystals may deposit in blood vessel walls and skin and other joints. So the take home for etiopathogenesis is that not all hyperuricemias are gouts and not all gouts have hyperuricemia. Certain risk factors which are immune mediated are very important and responsible. And some of them are genetically mediated which lead to an immune imbalance and thereby leading to an individualized response and a clinical presentation for an individual patient. Deposition is not necessarily in joints, so one has to look out for other systems as well. And genetic understanding is of primary importance because what we need and understand today is that this particular disorder requires targeted therapy to be able to uh, have a better clinical outcome in terms of not having a radiological footprint early on in the disease. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Prof. Sarabha. Uh, you have very rightly said in the very beginning that all hyperuricemia uh, are not gout and all gout do not have hyperuricemia. I would like a clarification from you at this point of time that there is a metabolic aspect of disease in gout. Is this a fact or not? Number two, at the stage of development of gouty arthritis, it is inflammatory or not. And as you have rightly mentioned, that autoimmunity has a role to play in pathogenesis. Would you clarify on these three? Metabolic? So first thing to talk about is that metabolic comorbidities may be present but there is no clear-cut demarcation or understanding whether it is uh, 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 positive, uh, whether it has a contributory role into the pathogenesis of the disease or it is an incidental uh, and finding. So there is no clear-cut uh, uh, immune or genetic mechanism on this. The second question which you have asked, sir, is that uh, autoimmunity. And autoimmunity is a very important part of the pathogenesis of gout because essentially what happens because of MSU crystal deposits is that it leads to uh, the activation of the inflammasome, which causes an activation of the pro-1, IL-1 beta to IL-1. And that essentially is a self-expressing, uh, a self-processing, self and a self-secreting uh, uh, process. And that is why the term autoimmunity has been mentioned with in the pathogenesis of gout. And the third question, can you just repeat, sir? Yes, you rightly said that it is basically autoimmunity uh, which has a triggering and active phase. So this autoimmunity is the major role to play in etiopathogenesis. Your third question, sir? Uh, the third, am I muted? No. 
the third question is that you finally said that it is autoimmunity which has a role to play so this is a fact yes sir it is a fact sir right now can i can my screen be seen no no sir okay fine now it is the turn of dr uh, manish khanna i think professor ravi uh, okay Sauta ravi sir has to ah be. something has gone wrong again with my presentation so we can so, request dr ravi ravi please yeah uh, good evening everybody uh, thank you dr cha and uh, thank you ioa uh, can you see my screen sir yes yes very much sir. and i am audible too yes yeah. very much so i will be talking about uh, forgotten crystal arthropathy that is calcium pyrophosphate deposits and uh, in this basically uh you know that uh, the, the, there is there are varied uh, articular manifestations of a cppd it is also known as uh, it is also known as uh, pseudo gout and most recognized crystal arthropathy is uh, gout but uh, next to it is uh, basically uh, calcium pyrophosphate and a basic calcium phosphate crystals uh, can cause acute calcification in the tendons and milwaukee shoulder uh, syndrome these are uh, other crystal deposits which can occur uh, like hydroxyapatite octa calcium phosphate tri calcium phosphate calcium oxalate uh, and uh, alkaptonuria uh, hemochromatosis and uh, other crystals which uh, we see in few of these patients which we operate for a total joint uh, replacement are uh, uh, corticosteroid uh, crystals which we can uh, Uh, see at times as far as the uh, epidemiology of the uh, cppd is concerned uh, prevalence is uh, 0.9 to 1 per 1000 and it is almost equal in men and women and uh, generally most of the patients are elderly above the age of uh, 60 classification basically these are four classes it can be Uh, hereditary it can be familiar uh, sporadic idiopathic and uh, associated with other metabolic disorders and in post traumatic conditions it is known as uh, class 4 as far as the pathogenesis is concerned basically uh, up to 36% of the patients above the age of 65 will have a radiological evidence of a, a calcium crystal deposit which is basically chondrocalcinosis and uh, pathogenic mechanism remains obscure and the risk factors for cppd are basically arthritis joint trauma joint surgery hemo uh, hemochromatosis metabolic and endocrine disorders and primary hyperparathyroidism and hypomagnesemia no proven association include uh, uh, with the hypothyroidism gout and wilson's disease as far as the mechanism is concerned basically it is uh, there are uh, you know these crystals they get uh, into the cell these are uh, at uh, uh, crystals can be phagocytosed and ultimately lead to a chain reaction of inflammation inside the cells and leading to uh, auto cell death and uh, thereby rupture of these cells once these cells get uh, they they also stimulate the formation of uh, osteoclasts similarly in bcp crystals there is a, there is a, you know activation of a pro uh, osteoclasts and ultimately there is a increased number of osteoclastic activity and that leads to uh, so called uh, resorption of the bone at uh, these different uh, sites and a precise mechanism of a calcium pyrophosphate crystal deposition in the cartilage is still unknown as far as the clinical features a variety of clinical man manifestations like type 1 type a is uh, 
pseudogout type b is pseudogout with rheumatoid arthritis c is pseudogout with osteoarthritis in acute or chronic phase it can be uh, type uh, d is with the uh, osteoarthritis in chronic form then in type e it is uh, lanthanic uh, chondrocalcinosis and type f is pseudogout in patients with the uh, uh, neuropathic arthritis and other uh, pseudogout presentation with the uh, ankylosing spondylitis and uh, hemo hemarthrosis and septic arthritis need to be evaluated more common is the uh, first uh, uh, three uh, and the less common are basically uh, last three uh, as far as these these are definitive correlations and possibly uh, there is a possible uh, correlation with the gout uh, in these uh, patients which can be seen uh, on the screening of uh, the these different disorders as far as the diagnosis is concerned it is very very uh, important to go through the history and clinical examination we should suspect in the patients uh, where uh, where there is a acute or a mono oligo uh, involvement uh, it could be pseudo gout where there is a chronic, chronic polyarthritis presentation swelling into the joint which typically seen in patients of a rheumatoid in association and uh, chronic pains in the joints is not a common involvement uh, mostly it could be association with osteoarthritis as far as the laboratory assessment is concerned esr crp may be normal in these patients uric acids are normal and coexisting hyperuricemia may be seen in few of these patients with gouty arthritis in association with cppd calcium phosphorus phosphorus and magnesium levels and intact parathyroid hormone is required to be done especially in the patients with endocrinopathies iron levels for those patients where there is a suspicion of a hereditary hemochromatosis and in a acutely swollen joint one has to be very careful that it could be septic arthritis so aspiration of the joint is uh, clinches the diagnosis and uh, it can be confirmed that these crystals are seen under the uh, polaroid microscopy and these are rhomboid type of a crystal which are slightly different from the monosodium urate crystals of a gout uh, so to exclude other conditions such as gout and infection in acute cppd white cell count generally ranges between 5000 to 25000 cells per micro uh, field and uh, Uh, there are lower numbers of leukocyte in the in the patients and they can be seen in chronic polyarthritis and high counts more than uh, 100000 can be seen in patients where there is a pseudo septic presentation of uh, these patients these are classical uh, crystals which uh, which can be seen under polarized microscopy which are monosodium and these are the rhomboid crystals which are Uh, different from the rod like rhomboid uh, weakly positive bifringent crystals which look bluish uh, are uh, usually uh, uh, seen in the uh, crystal uh, arthropathy when you look at the imaging you can see the calcification of the cartilage or a menisci you can see the triangular fibrocartilage getting uh, calcified one can also see the uh, see these uh, calcification into the intra articular area and uh, diagnostic criteria for cppd is to is identification of a cppd in on a chemical analysis on the x ray uh, uh, diffraction and also seen on the uh, electron microscopy Where, uh, the the other is to to a is when cppd cppd morphology is seen Uh, on the light microscopy or a polarized microscopy chondrocalcinosis on the x ray acute arthritic attack or a subacute chronic arthritis so basically when you have a first criteria which is met it is uh, definitely uh, cppd uh, which is uh, which can be seen uh, positive on the crystal uh, examination from the aspirate into the joint and probable uh, is when morphology or chondrocalcinosis and possible diagnosis uh, could be in acute arthritic attacks or a subacute chronic arthritic conditions generally uh, approach to a patient uh, those who are less than 50 years of age they may have a familial cppd uh, disease and those who are 
uh, having a family history which is positive. Those patients where who are less than 50 but no family history positive, in those patients it could be metabolic. And uh, above 60 uh, where family history is not positive, these patients could be idiopathic. As far as the management is concerned, acute uh, phase, you do the aspiration of the joint, intra-articular steroid can be injected if it turns out to be only CPPD uh, and not septic and colchicine can be given and NACID uh, are, uh, form the mainstay of the treatment. In subacute phase, uh, it is similar to osteoarthritis and treatment of the underlying disorder is necessary. Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee shoulder and knee syndrome, basically it is a, a destructive arthritis, uh, rare and in older age, usually more common in females, degenerative joint disease, tendinitis and rupture of uh, rotator cuffs, hydrops, shoulder and degeneration of the generally a lateral compartment arthritis is typical of uh, this particular disorder. And uh, one can see that uh, there can be, uh, you know, almost whole of the bone which disappears because of the osteoclastic uh, uh, activity, which is very, very high in these patients. Uh, similarly, one can see the destruction, especially a lateral compartment uh, osteoarthritis in the knee, which is common. As, uh, aspiration of the fluid could be milky or a straw from the joint. And uh, usually WBC count is less than uh, 1,000 1, uh, per cubic meter and crystals can be seen uh, on electron microscopy and shiny coins can be seen on the uh, light microscopy and there is no polarizing. As far as the differential diagnosis is concerned, CPD arthritis may present as acute monoarthritis, polyarticular or oligoarticular disease, neuropathic joint involvement and asymptomatic in certain, uh, maybe on the radiology. It its differential diagnosis can be extensively, uh, uh, should uh, uh, also include the trauma, bleeding and uh, infection in the joint and uh, other patients of CPD, CPPD may not have uh, usual risk factors, which is basically uh, for the hyperuricemia like obesity, hypertension or excessive alcohol intake and tophi are not found in the patients uh, with CPPD, crystal Fluid analysis is definitive of uh, uh, CPPD, but uh, it doesn't rule out the septic joint. The higher titers of this uh, rheumatoid factor in the synovial fluid, again, it is pseudo-rheumatoid arthritis. NTCCP uh, high levels is suggestive of association with rheumatoid. And uh, neuropathic uh, joint would typically show the characteristic of a uh, destruction into the joint on the histopathology. And uh, neuropathic arthropathy or a charcoal's joint, uh, one has to be uh, careful about uh, in those patients who have a comorbidities like syringomyelia, diabetes and other things. Wilson disease and hereditary hemochromatosis may be in association with this. As far as the treatment is concerned, you have to decrease the use of a shoulder. Recurrent aspiration from the shoulder intra-articular steroids may be given. NACID or supportive physiotherapy and surgery may be indicated in certain situations. As far as the acute attack or monoarticular pseudo-gout is concerned, aspiration uh, so, uh, in these patients, administration of NACID, colchicine is very effective in taking care of the pain. If it is single joint involvement, generally uh, local steroid is very effective and cold packs, joint immobilization can be done in these patients. More than two joint inflammation, generally it is impractical to aspirate and put, uh, systemic steroid may be helpful. Colchicine in 0.6 milligram uh, may be given once or twice a day is very effective and a prophylactic therapy uh, uh, can be given in few of these patients. These are various uh, modalities which are used even methotrexate, hydroxy, uh, chloroquine has also been tried in few of these patients. In a chronic situation, they may be very, very effective in, uh, beside the NACID in these patients. As far as the key points are concerned, deposition of a calcium uh, containing crystals uh, or calcium pyrophosphate uh, or a basic calcium, pyro uh, calcium phosphates are concerned. Uh, there is no drug which is available to prevent calcium deposits or to remove the calcium deposits. Sometimes when there is a calcific tendinitis, especially in the rotator cuff, uh, ultrasound guided uh, puncture of those calcific deposits can be done and a local steroid can be left there and generally it is seen that it uh, dissipates and disappears over a period of time and patient becomes 
uh, asymptomatic. As far as the diagnosis is concerned, accurate diagnosis is possible only on the polarized microscopy to detect the CPUTD crystals, which are classically rhomboid, bifragent, and uh, blue in color. To identify CP, uh, B, uh, BCP crystals uh, in the sinusoidal fluid is very, very difficult. And the BCP crystals are generally uh, found 100% cartilage sample in the patients with osteoarthritis and generally association with osteoarthritis is uh, probably a possibility. Crystals uh, for this uh, uh, can be seen in the various uh, structures like uh, fibroblasts, chondrocytes or sinuoidal macrophages. There are various drugs which uh, are in pipeline uh, for uh, which may be uh, later on helpful in management of uh, osteoarthritis uh, in, 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 in these patients uh, presenting with uh, basic calcium phosphate crystals. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, attention. And uh, over to you, Dr. Jha. Right. Very elaborate presentation regarding pseudo gout. So, you have very clear, clearly mentioned about the Milwaukee shoulder and also regarding high drops of the shoulder. So, in differential diagnosis, do you ever feel that this high drops of the shoulder has to be differentiated from tuberculosis? So, generally... Uh... Uh, patients may present with the pain and discomfort which uh, uh, which could be uh, pseudo, uh, presenting like a pseudo paralysis in few of these patients but there are certain overlapping conditions like uh, uh, we also need to differentiate these patients from uh, other uh, uh, they have a very acute onset of a pain and uh, once you get the x-ray done you would see that there are uh, either destructions in the periarticular region or there are calcifications which can be seen around. So, if, if there are these calcifications, then probably uh, it is more likely to be CPPD or uh, more towards the uh, crystal-induced arthropathy than uh, tuberculosis. All right. Uh, now, can I make a request to Professor Manish Khanna for making his presentation? Professor sir, Manish. Sir. Well, good evening, everyone, once again. So, uh, after a wonderful uh, session of what is CPPD, what is gouty arthritis, as orthopedic surgeons, uh, we have to move a little ahead while managing these patients. And definitely, uh, since we uh, can manage medically and we are already a surgeon, so we have to take some tips, I think, uh, Again, we need to have some. Sir, can you mute everybody from your end? Yes, I will. A lot of noise disturbances are coming. Lot of noise disturbance. Somebody is talking, please. Uh, something is wrong with my computer this evening. So, is, Dr. is Mr. Rishi there? Mr. Rishi I'll, I'll is there? I'll stop sharing right now so that we can see. Uh, I think Dr. D.P. Bhushan, sir, uh, voice is coming. We can yeah. request him. Dr. Bhushan? Yes, now I can mute all and after that you again unmute yourself. Yeah. Right. Unmute. Go ahead. You have not muted actually. But yeah. once again. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's done now. I'll just start sharing again. So, uh, being orthopedic surgeon, I think it's a peanut for us to 
uh, manage this cystoarthropathy whenever the surgical indications are there, whenever we want to use our knife. So just a very brief presentation. Uh, I'm just, I've just planned for this evening to just say what, where and when are the surgical indication for the cystoarthropathy. So the most important thing is whenever such patients like this uh, right toe with the first metatarsal being swelled up, it's always a very tempting attempt on our part to put a knife. It should be done because if it's not been done, then it will be going to burst away. And as the presentation will move on, you can appreciate the viscularity is the most important thing for the plastic surgeon and for orthopedic surgeon both. Once it's come out by itself, then definitely it will be a difficult task to manage surgically as the patient will be coming on for dressing and dressing and dressing. So identification, diagnosis, medical treatment and the surgical treatment when is required is the need of the hour for this evening. So swollen right great toe needs to be have a, a incision, but the left uh, ankle joint, which you can see, appreciate here, is swelled up, does not need because there's a lot of space in the ankle to accommodate any amount of the fluid and the vascularity is not an issue. And only the points where the vascularity is the issue, they usually burst up, uh, making the things aggressive. Idea of this workup is Definitely, for example, this olecran bursa, this I've taken out from my picture uh, library and I never knew that today I'm going to present such type of presentation. So, but definitely when uh, eight years back, I put a knife on this olecran bursa, which I felt that it is olecran bursitis or having a little infection. Actually, it was a, a CPPD type of a condition because the healing was very difficult. Hearing was deranged, the patient was kept on having a, you know, dressing and dressing and then present tracks and this and X, Y, Z was being used and finally it healed. It healed. So as an orthopedic surgeon, we always have an upper hand as a surgeon if we know the things medically very well. And that is why this evening workup is wonderfully very important. We all know and this by now that uric acid when comes down, then small, small tophi are not a big deal because they pass out through the urine. But if it is a good amount of a big tophi, then not, uh, then it's definitely going to either rupture it out or settle depending upon the location. Why the location, for example, this slide, I'm sorry. For example, this region, having a tophi is not going to rupture because there is a sufficient space. It has skilled itself with the fibrous tissue and it is a hard enough, it's not going to rupture at all. So when the tophi is large, depending upon the location, it ruptures. So it depends upon the vascularity of the part. If the patient is having a comorbidities like diabetes, if the lower limb is involved, definitely it's going to rupture. And that is the thing which we have to need when to put the knife to take out this chalky white material and what are the consequences actually. Now here, we can see that whenever there is inflammatory arthritis associated with crystal deposition, then definitely a medical management is required and the surgical uh, intervention is required. For example, in this uh, uh, index finger, uh, sorry, middle finger, when this was being opened, it looked like a rotten type of a mass. And definitely, if you know that you are going to open it up, we have to do a separate approach. Uh, taking the precaution for the vascularity as well as excessive dissection without damaging the vital structure. Otherwise, it will be a difficult task to heal it up. Easy to put a knife, but difficult to take a healing. Now, I'll just place a case, a very small, simple case, which may come to anybody's OPD. A 45, 44 year old lady presenting in the OPD with a palpable small swelling on the lateral side of the ankle. Now, this lady was complaining the swelling for four to five months of the time, duration, insidious and onset, pain was been there in the morning only, but no morning stiffness. So definitely we have ruled out any incidence of arthritis actually. The problem was that it was very troublesome to her. It was painful at some time, although on clinical examination, it was very small mass, which is easily you can be missed uh, on uh, examination unless and until spotted by the patient. Location was anterior to little malus. It was not fixed to any tendon. So definitely it was not uh, anything, you know, uh, any 
actinosanovitis of any tendon extensor tendons around the angle. Temperature was not being raised. Tenderness was not much bothering, but it was there. Actually, it was not to be removed, but unfortunately, fortunately, it was being removed. That is why I've kept this picture actually here. The investigation was normal. Uric acid was 5.6, which was not uh, high, but the patient was on hypouricemic drug. So this big mass of the TOFI, which was troubling to the patient, which usually does not, is a need of the hour to discuss such type of presentation to reach to a diagnosis. And definitely in presentation of Dr. Amanath also, it was been emphasized that what the investigations can be done. Yes, ultrasound is a very good investigation, which can give a clue for removing, uh, while if you want to remove putting a knife here, it's just a peanut job to remove it all for this white creamy chalk structure and sending it to histopathology is very important. Now, such type of swelling have to be differentiated from foreign body where the history would be there. Definitely ultrasound is a good exam, a good modality. Then tenosynovative, as I've already explained, giant cell tumor tendon sheath, very soft tissue deposit of amyloid, a very rare entity, and pigmented villanular synovital, which is very common in the knee, but not so much common in foot and ankle, but yes, it is there. Ultrasound is a good modality for differentiating it to a five, and definitely dual energy CT scan at those places, at those centers where MRI is not there, those cities where MRI is not there, because the dual energy CT scan they give different, different color codings, but they have, doesn't got any significance of saying that this green color go for a TOFI, this wallet color go for a TOFI. No, it's just a screening modality to just give a different color coding. The idea would be only formed when you can go for an MRI and that only to differentiate whether this swelling is a pigmented villanular synovitis, which definitely show a, a different picture for a radio, radio diagnostic person. And then you can decide whether to operate or not, or if it is a benign giant cell tumor. So all these swellings, they need a workup, whether this patient is for a pseudogout or not. And definitely as been explained in the lecture, pseudogout is characterized by acute monoarthritis of the knee. Now when there is acute monoarthritis of the knee, so there may be a synovitis, there may be a swelling, which may be due to the CPPD crystals. And in that case, you may need uh, aspiration also. Now, as already been explained that chondrocalcinosis is a very initial finding when we can pick up these CPPD things. But the thing is, these chondrocalcinosis may sometime, because of the infection, because of the triggering factor, they may land up into synovitis where you want to put a knife, but definitely you have to differentiate with a septic arthritis before going to it. The most important part is a knee joint, a DRA knee joint where the TKR has been done. Now the question arises for the longevity of the implant. The longevity of the implant will only be there if you can diagnose that particular knee or that particular shoulder, whether it is having a CPPD or not and treating it part so that the longevity can be increased. Here are the few points which can help us in making it out. Like cartilage and meniscal calcification has always been there but the most important thing when we, in the naked eye, we take out a meniscus, actually, the shining particles of the calcification, they itself demarcate that this is a CPPD, not, not a gouty arthritis. So from a naked eye examination on the OT table, one can demarcate. And of course, this is a part from a surgeon point of view, but from a pathological point of view, you have to send for the histopathology. 25% of the patient with serological and the radiological RA have a CPPD, this has already been diagnosed, uh, sorry, worked up this uh, evening. But the most important thing, you have to work it up whether this is a CPPD knee, which you're going to operate, or this is a RA knee, which is having a, a, a adjacent CPPD, because in that case, the treatment line of management will be different. Definitely a white paste appearance, as I've already mentioned, can give a crystal clear diagnosis. What you have to require to do is to send in a, a saline, uh, exam uh, saline uh, saline or uh, I mean you should not send in a formalin you should have a saline in your OT to send it for the histopathological examination and once it is proved from them then we can start for a proper treatment as in this evening this has already been mentioned sometime the patient comes to up with the swelling around the hand for example now this is an aggressive form of swelling this is a starting form of swelling where definitely not you need not to go for an incision but definitely here 
you have to work it out whether you are dealing with a cellulitis, whether you're dealing with a septic arthritis, where you're dealing with a crystal deposition disease, having inflammatory and a secondary infection. So definitely after uh, having a knife and doing all the mechanism, you know, you have to be uh, very particularly remembering to have in your OT saline or ethanol, not the formalin to send the sample for a proper diagnosis so that later on the, the, you know, the treatment would be very easy. Now, the surgical indication for the tophi removal are definitely lack of improvement despite the conservative treatment, painful tophi, otherwise the patient are not interested unless it is painful and the content is oozing it out, joint instability or the limitation of everyday activity. Uh, another picture where the uh, at the calcaneic cuboid joint is swelling has been there. Sorry for the quality of the picture and it was being removed. It was again a big tophi. Regulation, uh, regulations, the smarter tips, which is to be remembered is, as I've already mentioned uh, for the last five, six minutes, the circulation is the biggest drawback. As soon as TOFI get placed at the particular position, it raises the bat, the viscularity is decreased and a vigorous uh, active surgical skill will actually lead a later on difficulty in the wound healing. That has to be taken care of, number one. Number two is usually in the lower extremity, arteriosclerosis changes are already been there. There's no reason for that, but definitely a typical uh, CT NGO would be a good choice depending upon the requirement, not in all the cases. So surgical techniques are the simple, like pneumatic tunicate, if to be used, actually should not be used in the lower limb for all, for all practical purposes, but if to be used in the upper limb, suppose, then it has to be used with a lot of caution because the viscolarity is the issue. Similarly, for fingers and toe, local tunicate should not be used. Let it bleed, that's better actually. GA is preferable for L, uh, rather than LA because all these LA, they have a decreased component for the uh, peripheral vascular uh, vasoconstriction and definitely the excision will be easy, but the healing will be difficult. Distension of the tissue with LA definitely will jeopardize. So the idea for this talk is just to be cautious while dealing these things. Incision should be parallel to the blood supply as demands. Counter incision should not be there. It should be a single bold incision. Sharp dissection is preferred because we are damaging the, for example, this is being removed. So definitely we are damaging the extensive part of the tendon also. And that is why the patient wants to get it rid of. And it, it, gives, it, it gives a different picture actually. Gentle handling, wound irrigation is more, more important, much more than what we do in a, uh, any, you know, any uh, septic uh, condition where, you know, a lavage is important, but here it's very important. Taking care of the blood supply, minimal suturing to be done because all these liquefied contents will be going to come out, ooze out in uh, another 10, 15 days of time, which is good, finally. Pressure dressing should be given, but should be given for a short period because again, it's going to hamper the vascularity. So small, small, unimportant tips become very important for preventing this part and having a good recovery. Thanking you. Before signing off, I just want to emphasize another case, a 70-year-old male presenting with the OPD with swelling all around the knees and the elbows, swelling again uh, since two to three years, recent increase in pain and pain since three to four months. And we can appreciate here, almost the knee looks to be normal. Of course, there are some changes there, but definitely the type of the swelling which I'm going to present is not correlating with the extra finding. And this is the type of a swelling. This has still not been operated. A very recently uh, uh, seen patient uh, with us. And here we can appreciate uh, thick nodules which are there. One in the quadricep region, here again in the quadricep region, here in the infrapatilla region, here again. And this is actually troublesome to the patient, not this one actually. Here again in the front of the patella. As I've already mentioned in my first uh, two, three slides, these don't require actual removal because they are encapsulated with the fibrous tissue. So they are safe. They, are, they, are, uh, they remove the pain uh, capacity also. Now I'm zooming it out, it was been found a little calcinosis here. So definitely these, these are the features which needed to be taken care of. Now for this patient, I think in coming due course of months, I will be able to answer how we're going to approach. Definitely the ESR is 65, uric acid is 9.8, a very high uric acid level. 
CRP is been raised. Now, chronicity for many years leads to the deposition and lead to a secondary renal nephropathy, which is very well explained here by the level of urea and the creatine you can see here. Rheumatoid factor is normal and multiple nodules. So the differential diagnosis and the probable diagnosis and the therapeutic part all comes together after a proper management, medical management to be given here. So a, a, surgical, a surgeon should have a master medical management mind while treating these patients. So this is a uh, case which is to be continued from my, my side. And in a due course of time, whenever we'll meet, I'm literally going to update what we have done actually. Thank you so much for a very patient hearing. Thank Over you, Dr. Jha. Thank you very much, Professor Khanna. Uh, well, in your experience, have you ever noticed that TOFI may be within a year, preferably, or maybe even up to two years, not more than one inch in diameter, can dissolve with urate lowering therapy. So it usually dissolves, provided uh, they are in the space where there is a lot of, you know, uh, movement is there. For example, if you are dealing with a joint, knee joint, shoulder joint, they can dissolve. But if you are dealing with a small presentation here on the tip of the toe or tip of the finger, then usually by that time it are encapsulated by fibrous tissue and they are just lying out as such because the vascularity is again an option. Even if the hyperuricemic drugs have been used, they are not able to flush it off from that particular location. Right. And in cases of joint replacement, before you actually embark on performing a joint replacement, you must exclude that you are not dealing with a case of gout. Because if you have missed the diagnosis, maybe it creates problem post-operatively. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and if it is a gout, it should be very well managed before putting a knife. Uh, Dr. Raja, I would like your comments here also. Dr. Raja, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, okay. So, uh, joint replacement in a patient of gout, if the diagnosis has been missed early, uh, what is the likely difference in prognosis? One is that uh, inflammation is uh, right, uh, really high after uh, surgery. So, especially in acute flare-up of gout and we miss it and then we don't treat it properly, we take them up for surgery. Post-operative period is going to be very stormy and painful. The ESR CRP is going to be elevated and wound healing can be delayed. So, we always uh, uh, keep thinking whether there is a coexisting infection or a new infection or periphrastic joint infection has happened. That is one of the... Uh, problems when, uh, when we miss a diagnosis of gout. So always all our patients, we screen for uh, uric acid, get the uric acid to normal before we actually take them up for uh, surgery. Right. Thank you very much. Now, my as I have told you, my computer is not working. It has gone haywire. So next presentation is Dr. Raja, yours? Sir, Dan, the next one is mine. Dr. Dr. Okay, Mohit. Mohit. Dr. Mohit. So Mohit. Please go ahead with your presentation. Mohit. Yes. Uh, so my screen is visible. My screen is visible to everyone. Yes. Yes, yes. Dr. Mohit. Please. Yeah, it's yeah. visible. It's visible. Thank you, Ayu and Dr. Jha sir, for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk on this topic and. Uh, after moving from the surgical indication, that was a uh, you know mind-opening presentation, especially the case report and the, the one that is to be discussed later. We'll discuss that. Now we move on to the therapeutic options in the gout uh, along with the latest update. So I'll be discussing uh, about the treatment discussions in acute gout flares, uh, urate lowering therapy, when to do, when not to do, and then what to do in patients with asymptomatic hyperuricemias, then in special circumstances like Older patients, pregnancy, lactations, patients on anticoagulant, end stage kidney disease, and transplantation. So, first of all, coming over to the acute gout flares, it's a painful and disabling inflammatory arthritis, usually involving one or more joints. The goal is obviously prompt and safe termination of pain and disability. Now, the general therapeutic principle would be early treatment as early as possible until two to three days after complete resolution. Duration usually lasts from for not more than five to seven days if started within 12 hours. 
Now, uh, the uh, point to be noted is we have to continue the urate lowering therapy even during the flares. To facious gout, we always treat like an acute gout flare. Initial treatment in a gout flare consists of three drugs, glucocorticoids, NSAIDs, and colchicine. However, there is no single best agent, so we have to choose the uh, uh, drug amongst these three as appropriate for the patient. Now, factors affecting the drug choice would be patient-related medical factors having, you know, various comorbidities like kidney, liver, cardiovascular diseases, and patient's gout history, which include total flare numbers, recent rate of flare occurrence, patient's prior flare experience. Then differential diagnosis that Dr. Ravi has already spoken, uh, we need to rule out infection. Then characteristics of the gout flare, uh, which includes the duration of symptoms, number of affected joints, injection, accessibility, and clinical settings. Then the most important are logistic factors and the patient preference, like drug availability, what drugs are available in that area, the cost and the location of the patient, and clinical expertise. I'll be explaining it later on. So coming over to the glucocorticoid therapy, we can give it by oral, parenteral, which includes intravenous or intramuscular or intra-articular injection. Choice could be made between prednisone, prednisolone, and triamcinolone. Now, oral glucocorticoids to be given in patients with polyarticular involvement where there is no availability of joint arthrosynthesis, arthrosynthesis and injection. Prednisone can be given 30 to uh, 40 milligram once daily or uh, in two divided doses. Now, parenteral glucocorticoids can be given in hospitalized patients with polyarticular involvement who do not have any contraindications for glucocorticoids. Now, as I was talking about the clinical expertise, so intraarticular glucocorticoid we have to give when there is one or two joint involvement. So expertise has to be available. Uh, then if the patient is not able to take oral medicines, the best is to aspirate, do gram staining culture and polarizing light microscopy examination. Then before going ahead with the injection as already been discussed. Now, trimacillone acetamide can be given 40 milligram for the large joint and the less doses can be given for the small joints. Now, this is one of the paper which also says that if Amongst all the three drugs are contraindicated, then adenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, is a very attractive therapeutic option for hospitalized patients who have an acute gout flare while being hospitalized. Now, the next class of drug is uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which includes endomethacin, brufen, diclofenac, meloxicam, silicoxib. Now, uh, the point to be noticed is aspirin should not be used to treat acute gout flare because of the paradoxical effects of salicylates on serum urate resulting from uric acid uh, retention, thereby increasing in the serum uric acid levels. The third one is colchicine therapy. It's a good alternative, you know, when NSAIDs or glucocorticoids are contraindicated. Dosage would be 0.5 milligram, sometimes 0.6 milligram uh, tablet is available in some countries. The cost is very cheap, 2.5 rupees per tablet. However, the dose needs to be reduced in renal or hepatic impairment. Side effects include diarrhea, cramping, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. Sometimes rarely they do cause cytopenia, rhabdomyolysis, myopathy, peripheral neuropathies. Now, one thing uh, important for uh, colchicine is it, it is contraindicated in patients who are on PGP inhibitors like macrolide antibiotics, cyclosporine, tacrolimus, amiodarone, and cytochrome P3A4 inhibitors like HIV protease inhibitors. So in, that, in those patients, <clears throat> colchicine has to be avoided altogether. Now, coming over to the second point, uh, the urate lowering therapy in chronic gout. Now, there are two class of drugs. The first one is the drugs inhibiting uric acid synthesis like allopurinol, febuxostat, then the drugs which increase the uric acid excretion from the kidneys, including probenicid and sulfenpyrazone. Allopurinol, it's the earliest most xanthine oxidase inhibitor, dosage 100 to 300 milligram daily or in divided doses. Very cheap tablet. We should always start the treatment with allopurinol 2 to 3 rupees per tablet. The lower dose is uh, required in hepatic and renal insufficiency. Side effects, uh, one side effect that needs to be mentioned is allopurinol hypersensitivity, Steven Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis, which include pruritic papular skin rash, fever, hepatitis, eosinophilia, renal impairment. The other ones are GI upset, alopecia and cataract. Now, hematinex should be avoided as it interferes with the hepatic iron stores and uh, There is a problem with the connection, I think, with Dr. Mohit's presentation. So, whose is the next presentation? 
Is it mine? Manish, can you look at the uh, program? I think it's mine, sir. Sir, Dr. Raja's presentation. My presentation. So you're muted, sir. Ja, sir, you're muted. Okay. okay. So till the time that Mohit can come back, I think uh, you should proceed with your presentation. Uh, he is saying he's connecting with. Should we wait or we'll go ahead, sir? Okay. We can wait for just a minute. So friends, as far as management of gout is concerned, we have to look into the armamentarium that we have. Similarly, we always keep on choosing our instruments before going for a particular surgery. So similarly, we have to look into various stages of the disease. And now the disease is not classified as acute and chronic, we say there is a gout flare, there is a intercritical stage, and we can say there is a chronic stage. So we have so many drugs available in our basket, which are basically urate lowering therapy. Are you there? Okay. Dhansekar, yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cha and uh, all the uh, faculty members of the IOA Rheumatology Committee. I'm going to talk about calcium oxalate and miscellaneous crystal arthropathies. Uh, first, we talk about oxalate crystal deposition disease. Uh, it, this is a type of a very uncommon type of arthritis characterized by deposition of calcium oxalate crystals within the sinoid fluid, typically seen in patients with hyperoxaluria. Uh, it indicates elevated uh, blood oxalate levels, which gets deposited in the tissues. Uh, oxalate is an organic compound that can be generated endo endogenously via metabolism or incorporated exogenously via the diet. So there are basically two types. Primary hyperoxaluria, which is a gen genetic disorder resulting in endogenous overproduction. Or secondary hyper hyperoxaluria, where there is increased absorption from the gut. Uh, because of high dietary oxalate intake. The typical high oxalate foods include spinach, rhubarb, sweet potatoes, peanuts, and tea. Uh, these cellular culture experiments have shown that once the oxalate crystals get adhered to the cell cells, they call, cause a cascade of response that includes crystal internalization, changes in gene expression, cytoskeletal reorganization, and possible cellular proliferation. So there's deposition of uh, crystals inside the joint, bone, uh, even vas vessels, muscles, and nerves. So they present with bone pain, joint pain, can be acute or chronic, skin oxalate deposition, myocardiopathy, ob obliterative vascular disorders, or periodontitis. So usually the DIP and PIP of the fingers are the commonly affected uh, joints. It also in, uh, affects wrist, elbow, knee, ankle, and feet. The, Previously damaged joints like DIP, where there is uh, deposition happens, there is also soft tissue calcification. It mimics erosive osteoarthritis or atypical diuretic related gout. Deposition in nerves causes polyradical neuropathy and muscle, it causes uh, painful myopathy. Uh, excuse yeah. me, I am going to mute everybody. Raja, you unmute after that, right? Yes, yeah. Unmute. Yes, sir. Right. So the image of the DIP joint shows there is a soft tissue calcification around the uh, joint and also erosion of the articular surface. There is also deposition of uh, calcium oxalate crystals in the skin and formation of multiple granuloma. You can see the, uh, the middle image there is deposition in the metatorsophalangeal joints, the soft tissue calcification. And the image on the right shows uh, uh, finger joint soft tissue calcification with uh, articular erosion uh, resembling a hyperparathyroidism. So investigations include high resolution CT scan, bone biopsy can demonstrate the oxalate crystals and granuloma. Bone marrow involvement can cause anemia resistant to erythropoietin stimulating agents. Biopsy of the peripheral nerve can reveal uh, crystal deposition. 
within the axons and epineural blood vessels, which leads to demyelination. Uh, radiograph does not differentiate it from CPPD. Uh, the gold standard in diagnosis demonstration of positively birefringent crystals within the synovial fluid or tissue that stain positive for alizarin red. This is a uh, typical stain used to differentiate this type of arthropathy from other type of crystal arthropathies. Secondary hyperoxaluria can be diagnosis in cases of uh, GI mal absorption like small intestinal resection, bariatric surgery for obesity, chronic pancreatitis, and inflammatory bowel disease. If there is coexisting diseases like this, it can result in secondary hyperoxaluria, but diagnosis is done by uh, orthocentesis and cyanol fluid analysis and staining with alizarin red. Treatment uh, is uh, basically NSAIDs, colchin, and steroids. It should be avoided when there is renal problem or uh, renal transplant recipients. Uh, intraarticular steroids or oral steroids help in acute flare-up. Interleukin one beta inhibitor therapies are uh, coming up. Uh, for a primary oxalate uh, oxaluria, treatment is hemodialysis. These patients have renal and liver transplant as a final option. Uh, low fat and low oxalate diet can be useful for uh, these patients, both primary and secondary oxaluria. Coming to the calcium ap uh, appetite deposition disease, it usually happens in the periodical uh, location due to deposition of calcium uh, hydroxyapatite, uh, usually around the rotator cuff of the shoulder. It can acute uh, uh, CPPD disease can present like a malignancy or an infection. So this is an example of typical uh, deposition in the shoulder. There is an ill-defined, inhomogeneous calcified mass around the rotator cuff insertion. So how do we differentiate it from myositis uh, ossificans? They don't have cortical margins. And uh, uh, these are, uh, you have to differentiate diagnosis between a, a tendon or bone avulsion. Bone avulsions have irregular margins, but these CPPD deposition have very smooth margins and homogeneous appearance. They are also can be seen in the hip periarticular tissues uh, around the MCL insertion around the knee, in the elbow, or in the gluteal tuberosity region. The tendon insertions are more prone for C uh, calcium appetite deposit. CT scan show, can show uh, uh, the calcified mass uh, better. MRI shows gross periarticular uh, edema, uh, around soft tissue edema around these calcified spots, and bone scan shows increased uptake. But these type of investigation modality are not necessary. But if you have acute presentation mimicking infection or malignancy, we can use these additional uh, uh, modalities. So acute uh, symptomatic uh, CADD usually can be treated conservatively. Uh, chronic uh, disorders can be treated by minimally invasive techniques or surgery. Extra corporeal short weight uh, therapy are very useful. And barbitage, which we already discussed, is multiple needling of the uh, lesion are also helpful. The last uh, uh, arthropathy I've discussed is ochronotic arthropathy. It was described way back in 1908 by Sir Archibald Gerard as an inborn error of metabolism. It's the first uh, human disease uh, uh, described as transmitted by autosomal recessive in inheritance. It is 1 in 2 lakhs to 1 in uh, 1 lakh per live birth incidence. The enzyme deficiency is homogenesis 1 to dihydrogenase, leads to accumulation of homogenesic acid, which forms a melanin-like polymer, which gets deposited into the cartilage and soft tissues. In knee, the clinical radiological diagnosis is usually not very typical. They have osteoarthritis with uh, inflammatory type of presentation. Sometimes we can have a retrospectively diagnosis with the uh, intradiscal calcification of the uh, intervertebral disc. Sometimes they present with the spontaneous avulsion of tendons like a tendo Achilles or quadriceps and patellar tendon. So on opening, we find this black deposition. So always uh, it is a retrospective diagnosis. Uh, we, do not, we cannot diagnose uh, ochronosis as a clinical entity. Unless they have typical presentation like this, this is an sign that is with pigmentation of the sclera or pigmentation in the hand. Uh, retrospectively, we go back and see that urine on standing becomes uh, dark because of presence of reducing substance or when you're doing a hemiotroplasty for fraction neck or a THR for arthritis, we see that there is a melanin type uh, deposition in the cartilage. So 
This is an example of a patient who had bilateral knee replacement and bilateral hip replacement, shoulder replacement, and spine fusion for uh, ochronotic disease. The, due to deposition of the ochronotic pigments in the uh, spinal uh, 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 column, there is uh, there is a neurological compromise which has to be uh, decompressed and stabilized. For the knee, we have uh, done a, a, a joint replacement and the shoulder replacement. So one more example of bilateral knee and bilateral hip replacement. The spine X-ray is typical, and we cannot miss this intradiscal calcification. Very typical of ochronosis. We have published this series of uh, 34 patients uh, on the European Journal of uh, Orthopedic Surgery and Traumatology. So treatment is only conservative. If your uh, patient has symptomatic arthritis, joint replacement is very helpful. With this, uh, I thank for the thank you for the opportunity. Right. Thank you, Dr. Raja, for a very good presentation on a very unusual topic. And you have performed, uh, shown all the surgeries which are likely to be performed and the other aspect of management. Mohit, are you back? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. please right. go ahead with your presentation. Yes, sorry for the interruption. No, no, you can't help it. I'm going through the same thing. Right. So uh, we were talking about uh, allopurinol and the side uh, and its side effects. So basically, I have covered all of it. And uh, now the next one is febuxostat. Uh, it's also a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. Comes in dosages of 40, 80, 120 milligram. The price is a little on the higher side, 13 to 15 rupees per tablet. It is preferred in renal diseases. The side effects include. Uh, diarrhea, headache, uh, increased liver enzymes, nausea, and skin rash. It should be avoided in pregnancy and lactation. Now, the another one is topiroxostat, new kid on the block. It uh, comes in the dosage of 20, 40, and 60 milligram. Price is a little lower than febuxostat, rupees 8 per tablet. Now, it has got an advantage than febuxostat is it significantly lowers serum urate uh, levels in hyperuricemic patients receiving hemodialysis and may preserve renal function in patients with overt diabetic nephropathy. So basically preferred uh, in uh, patients with deranged uh, uh, renal functions. Now coming over to the uricosuric drug, probenicid, it's a highly uh, lipid soluble benzoic acid blocks the resorption of urate. It uh, comes in a dosage of 250 to 500 milligram twice daily. One uh, thing that uh, needs a special mention is it should be given with the plenty of fluids along with alkalinization of urine. The Another one is sulfine pyrazone. Action is additive to it, the preven acid, comes in a dosage of 100 to 200 milligram twice daily. Next one is benzbromine, newer and more potent uricosuric drug in a dosage of 60 to 80 milligram per day. Then the newer drugs which are not in very common use are levotofisopam and arhalofinate. Then another one is lessi neurad. Now, this is a newer uh, drug with a new mechanism of action, rasburicase. It's a recombinant version of urate oxidase, which an enzyme which metabolizes uric acid to allantoin. It is given intravenously. The uh, price is about 7,800 rupees per vial uh, of 1.5 milligram. Now, it has to be used cautiously in patients with G6PD deficiency for whom it is contraindicated because it can cause methemoglobinemia. There has been an incidence of anaphylaxis with this drug. Peglotase is the same to rasburicase. However, it is pegylated, which increases its elimination half-life, making it suitable for long-term treatment when compared to raspberry case. Now, uh, coming over to the guidelines now, urate lowering therapy guidelines as per NICE, a National Institute for Health and uh, Care Excellence, UK. So, urate lowering therapy should be started after the first attack. Then, if there are more than two attacks in six months, then renal diseases, uric acid, renal stones, tophi, and prophylactically, it can be given in patients on cytotoxic drugs and diuretics. Now, the latest guidelines that have come up with are 20, uh, at American College of Rheumatology guidelines in 2020. So, basically, we'll be going through that guidelines. So, uh, one thing that uh, uh, needs uh, mention is lifestyle modification. We have to limit alcohol intake, purine intake, and high fructose corn syrup, and weight loss is recommended if the patient is obese. Vitamin C to be added, although American College of Rheumatology do not recommend it. Now, uh, I was going, uh, uh, listening to Dr. Raja's uh, slide also because higher doses of vitamin C is not advocated because higher doses of vitamin C con is converted to oxalate and it can give rise to calcium oxalate stone. So, low dose vitamin C can be given to the patients who are on urate lowering therapy. Dietary advice, as usual, avoid alcohol, red meat, fish, yeast extract. 
then the general principle of treatment are always start with lower dose of uh, drugs irrespective of the uh, ult class now when to start is when there is subcutaneous tophi one or more frequent gout flare two or more in a year and for patients with first uh, flare you start uh, ult only when the uric acid level is more than 9 mg per deciliter or the patient is in chronic kidney disease stage 3 or more or, or he or she has urolithiasis now asymptomatic hyperuricemia means there is no gout flare no tophi no need to start a, a urate lowering therapy only if the patient is asymptomatic and he doesn't have any comorbidities sometimes in our clinical practice we see patients with non specific pains like backache shoulder pains myalgia in whom uric acid level is high we can start urate lowering therapy then hyperuricemia in cardiovascular patients you should start urate lowering therapy because the hyperuricemia is itself a pro inflammatory condition it causes systemic inflammation and also it causes uric acid causes endothelial dysfunction hence there is definite role of uh, uh, you know hyperuricemia treatment in cardiovascular patient and same goes with the renal patients it has been shown to delay the progression of renal failure in uh, uh, patients of renal disease if we treat hyperuricemia now allopurinol should be preferred over all other drugs including those in patients with ckd stage 3 or more then xanthine oxidase inhibitor preferred over uric acid acid as such then concomitant anti inflammatory prophylaxis therapy for at least 3 to 6 months when whenever we are starting urate lowering therapy then start urate lowering therapy even during gout flare as the patient is more compliant and he will listen to to the doctor now there is a concept called treat to target therapy in which we titrate the dose as per the uric acid level for a serum uric acid target of less than 6 mg per deciliter this includes patient's education shared decision making and treat to target protocols now a few points that need special mentions with allopurinol are uh, we need to uh, screen the patients with hla b star 5801 especially in patients of southeast asian and african american descent as incidence of steven johnson syndrome is high in these patient if allopurinol allergy is present and other oral uh, urate lowering drugs are contraindicated then desensitization has to be done with allopurinol and it has to be started febuxostat should be avoided in patients with cardiovascular disease or those with fresh cardiovascular events then uric acid acid before starting as i mentioned we have to improve the hydration we have to give plenty of fluids we can alkalinize the urine also but there is no need to check urinary uric acid levels now when to switch to other xanthine oxidase inhibitors in urate lowering therapy you start with allopurinol first if still there is an incidence of frequent gout flare or subcutaneous tophi we switch to febuxostat or topiramazepine rather than starting on uricosuric uh, uricosurics then even if after the uricosurics if the patient is not getting relieved and if the patient continues to have frequent flares or subcutaneous tophi then paclitaxel therapy which is intravenous therapy can be started now gout flare uh, as discussed we can give three drugs glucocorticoids nsaids and colchicine then there are certain second line drugs which are in still in experimental phase il1 inhibitor like anakinra and kenakinumab which can be given beyond supportive or analgesic treatment for hospitalized patient who cannot take oral medicine glucocorticoids preferred over il inhibitor one inhibitors or uh, acth topical ice can be used as a local adjuvant treatment now talking about the special condition those who are on anticoagulants low dose colchicine if not contraindicated is the best convenient if efficacious drug because it has no effect on blood clotting and there is no need for joint arthros uh, arthrosynthesis or injection then oral glucocorticoids only if there is a polyarticular involvement but we have to rule out history of peptic ulcer disease or gi bleeding then joint aspiration and glucocorticoid injection can be given but we have to do coagulation profile first in order to avoid hemarthrosis then one nsaid that can be given in those patients who are on anticoagulant is celecoxib because it has it does not have the anti platelet property as uh, other nsaids have now short acting interleukin 1 inhibitor like anakinra and kenakinumab subcutaneously can be given in patients with uh, who are on anticoagulants now pregnancy and lactation glucocorticoids are preferred one nsaids can be given before 30 weeks of gestation as after that it can cause premature closure of ductus arteriosus later and it, it should be avoided in renal dysfunction now uh, love you so it up yeah colchicine is contraindicated in both pregnancy uh-huh. and lactation and in lactating female either glucocorticoids or nsaids can be given now in older adults glucocorticoids are preferred generally given because they are given for the short terms now end stage kidney disease and uh, transplantation we give intra articular oral or parenteral glucocorticoids 
NSAIDs should be completely avoided, but they can be used sometimes in, if the patient is on chronic hemodialysis with no residual kidney function. If the patient has residual kidney function, it should be avoided altogether. Now, colchicine is also to be avoided as it is not removed by dialysis. Now, sometimes we have situation where the patient uh, with gout uh, has hypertension, so we have to see that we have to stop hydrochlorothiazides as they ca cause a hyperuricemia and then we switch over to losartan. Which is, uh, which is a mild uricosuric agent. Now, there is no need to stop aspirin in low doses. However, in higher doses, we can't give that. But if patient has got cardiovascular comorbidities and aspirin has to be given, then it, it can be given in low doses. There are a lot of studies on that. Now, uh, regarding the dyslipidemia patients, no need to add phenofibrates if dyslipidemia is present because phenofibrates do not offer additional advantage of lowering the uric, uh, uric acid levels. Now, here I conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohit, for a very wonderful presentation on all facets of management of gout. And I think you should make us uh, conscious of also regarding the price of some of the medicines which luckily are still not available in India. And one such drug is Peglotikase. Yes. The price of one ml of this drug is 36,000 US dollars. And it has to be given every week or fortnightly. Can you tell us the dose, Peglotikase? Yes. So uh, Raspberrycase, I mentioned the vial 1.5 milligram. Right. Case, I because it is not available in India. Right. It, don't is, go to that. it is one ml given IV in 250 ml normal saline, and it has to be repeated at most at 15 days in interval. So okay. insurance companies have a big role to play, but this is definitely indicated only in cases where the it is refractory to other modes of management. So, as I was talking when you, you got interrupted, that we have to look into our armamentarium of drugs that we are, that are available with us and look into the stage of the disease, uh, keep the patients under regular follow-up. Follow-up is so very important, but unfortunately, this is not so in our country. But at least one thing I have observed that incidence of gout has increased almost double fold, more than the increase in population or higher, uh, uh, higher uh, longevity. So with this uh, scenario, there is consciousness in patients. They will come forward and tell, tell you, doctor, I have got my uric acid done and it is normal. And then you are at least starting from a point where the patient is already there with the uric acid and related reports. Yes. Well, friends, uh, now it is... One almost... thing I want, to, just, I want to mention, because the incidence you said, uh, I, what I've seen in my practice is because of the diet, dietary habits they have changed. You know, patients more and more are eating high protein diet like soya beans and uh, especially the non veg. So that's why it is causing more, uh, you know, incidence of gout and hyperuricemia. Uh, that is uh, something very true that diet has a role, I said in the very beginning, nutrition. But now people have also come to the conclusion that diet alone or diet in majority of the circumstances is not one limiting factor in management of gout. It yes. will have to revolve around urate lowering therapy. Yes. Now, friends, we have only four or five minutes left. After this was my presentation. Unfortunately, uh, my computer is also working haywire. So I will talking only in few sentences about what I intended to present. Friends, all of us know that, that gout is a separate disease and rheumatoid arthritis is a separate disease. 
what i wanted to say through this presentation that both can coexist though very few cases have been reported but there are reports and there are reports from countries like new zealand and other countries that they do exist but total reported cases do not exceed more than 100 but the other argument is that something is not being reported does not mean that they do not coexist friends if drugs given to the patient for rheumatoid arthritis or maybe nsaid induced renal function defect the kidney once it is affected this will result into poor functionality and so there is hyperuricemia well there are drugs also which Uh, uh which uh, somehow helps uh, in elimination of uric acid from blood like lefnunamide like il1 so they keep on clearing uric acid and hence also in a case of rheumatoid arthritis this is not visible so in refractory cases we have where we have treated our gout patients treatment to target and they have not responded we must look into investigation investigating the patient where the other disease is present and vice versa two things elderly patients obese patients these two are patients who are likely to suffer from gout so if it is a patient of rheumatoid arthritis polyarticular pattern and the patient is elderly and obese think of gout as well uh with these words i would like to uh, request professor dilip mazumdar in fact uh, we had certain quiz questions which i am not coming forward today so yeah professor mazumdar please we want to back to athe or actually thank you professor ja it is uh, too late today right and everybody was a genius here and the genius have already already told about the uh, different drugs and yeah it is start with the panang bhushan who actually the genetic role of the gouty arthritis and he ellen ellen syndrome was there and this was really uh, uh, eyes breaking i can tell you this eyes breaking right. and uh, many things the orange sand story of 1964 starting from the agpt gold what is the gold standard exogenous endogenous role how they is hitting the basal ganglion in the axis and all things have been covered up and uh, this uh, this was a marvelous thing that i i was there and how the anger anger has caused and the, there is also infliction on the body so there are dangerous thing that that has also occurred he has told about beautiful stories and all that background very nice ovaliance was again a uh, thing that the, the crystal disorders etopathogenesis and he has again told about the endogenous and exogenous these things and uh, the uh, gout pathology and how the 36 persons only develop gout and gouty trophy how it it becomes uh, becomes chronic and acute attack chronic attack what is the background and urate overproduction how it has been there with the cytokines and uh, this uh, neutrophils uh, how they are actually acting over the atrophy to inflammation and all that this inflammation going for to actually mimic the rheumatoid arthritis in the small cells so targeted therapy he has actually told about the calcium oxalate and all then comes the ravi sautra ravi sautra actually he calcium uh, actually he has got the forgotten crystals of the calcium pyrophosphate so this uh, cppd that is causing this uh, pseudo gout and classifications from 1 to 4 again the same thing he has also pointed out in 36% 
have got the uh, chronic uh, uh, final outcome. So there are risk risk factors of the CPVP. The CPVP risk factors are type A2, type F, and that cause actually this pseudo gout. So this uh, uh, his clinical history, clinical examination, and all things have been he has given in a nice way. And in joint aspiration, and he also told about the Milwaukee shoulder that you also pointed out the Milwaukee shoulder and the knee problems, whether it can be uh, confused with the Cox infection or not that you have told. So fluid analysis is important to find out the both. Whether the fluid analysis you have done, that will actually prove that whether it is going for Cox or not. Then money is actually told, money is actually, I think money has become the man of the match because he, what, where, when, all these things he has, when to actually hold the knife. Whether they will wait for bursting, uh, bursting with them by the atrophy through the skin out or the white fluid that will be coming out, then we will hold the knife? No. He has done in a nice way and the location is very important where you have to go for the operation. So TKR, or the TKR longevity of the implant will be more or that you also also see for that. And the regulations to be followed. What is the regulations? That is the most important is the vascularity. If the vascularity is less and you are doing the operation, then what will happen? All disasters will occur. So gentle handling of these tissues and repeated deprivement he has done. Thorough wash. So Mohit Arora has again, he has told about the medical management. All new, uh, all drugs he has told about, but allopurinol and colchicine therapy he has also, and again, one thing he has told about the ACTH. This ACTH we actually do use in case of adrenal suppression. But he has also hinted about, about that uh, thing, glucocorticoid therapy. There are three layers of that. Intraarticular hydrocortisone after respiration, but must have a culture because septic arthritis also can confuse. Dhansekar Raja, yeah, calcium oxalate and miscellaneous crystals. So again, he also told about the primary two types, secondary and joint uh, has got the chronic finger joints and the most is the common is the finger joints and the knee. So in investigation of HRCT, that uh, bone biopsy and uh, positive uh, um, alizarin uh, positive alizarin red staining, that is important for those uh, crystals. So the CPPD shoulder involvement, again he has told about the ESWT that is actually therapy, sort of therapy and multiple needling, multiple needling and he has also pointed out the melanin like pigmentation with the uh, presentation of the position of the joint. A spontaneous evolution of tendons and uh, the pigmentation, pigmentation of the sclera and oncotic also uh, or orthopathy, or chronic orthopathy, but TKR is that it is advisable. Then comes the Amarnath. Amarnath has actually, I could not, uh, I was some disturbance was there, but still, like coexistence, the gout in uh, this investigations of the crystal orthopathies he has told about, and he has told radiological investigation. Very nice radiological of double line he has shown that I still remember. And uh, this, uh, uh, the petrofemoral joint, that is in the petrofemoral joint, is a non-weight bearing joint, but having that type of uh, osteophytes. So that investigation, radical, radical investigation, he has told about, but not expensive investigations. And Professor Jha has also, because there are some problem with the transmission, so he has told about the uh, how the rheumatoid arthritis coexists with the they're very rare, actually very rare, very, very rare. Uh, I do not know how many cases uh, I have seen in my life, but it is very rare, but coexistence may occur. It is important because of the inflammatory stage of the disease of the, uh, the crystals. When there's the inflammatory stage, that actually mimic the rheumatoid arthritis. That is the problem. But regarding the joint damage, uh, that is, as he has told, the joint damage is not that the intraarticular, it is rather extraarticular or away from the joint line. 
but the rheumatoid is actually the concentric reduction. So that is the way you, you have to find out. But clinical examination is a must, and that will give you the lot of clue. Even in the olecranon bursitis to the this uh, nodule, it can be very well can be seen in clinical examination. So thank you, everybody. All golden speakers have done a nice job today in the night. Almost is going to be midnight, I think, isn't it? No, no, only think. 10 p.m. We are it's only 10. Sorry. Sorry. It's <laughs> only 10 p.m. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, sorry. Professor Majumdar. Sorry, and I, 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 no. I actually apologize. Okay. Uh, for so the mistake. I, 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 I would like, I would like yeah. to highlight one point as well. Today yeah. we have been talking about hyperuricemia and gout, but Dear friends, there is a condition of hypouricemia also. Yeah. So whenever the serum uric acid is 2.5 and below, become conscious of some renal disease, right? So this is one point that I wanted to make note of. And number two points, I will like to resp uh, respond uh, I, I will like uh, three speakers to respond, Dr. Manish Khanna, Dr. Abhay, and uh, Dr. Mohit. Uh, hyperuricemia and gout. And there has been an American College of Rheumatology. So this question, first of all, goes to Mohit. That Mohit, what is the status of 2020 ACR recommendation regarding treat management of hyperuricemia. Like I said, uh, as per the ACR guidelines in asymptomatic hyperuricemia, they don't uh, recommend any uh, urate lowering therapy. But what I found in my other papers were that if the patient is having a cardiovascular disease or a renal disease or urolithiasis, then it is better to start uh, uh, urate lowering therapy. For cardiovascular, there is no doubt because a lot of paper says because it is uh, hyperuricemia is a pro-inflammatory marker. It causes systemic inflammation. It causes endothelial dysfunction. So for heart patients, we definitely need to start. Now for the kidney one, there are conflicting evidence. Some papers say that Yes, of course, we can start because it delays the progression of renal failure. But some people say that, okay, it doesn't have any effect. So, but I would say that whatever I've read that, yes, it should be started. Right. Uh, Dr. Manish, you would like to respond to this. Hyperuricemia itself is an indication that there is something going wrong. And if hyperuricemia is there, we need to find out what is the reason and the reason would be there. And it has to be worked out because otherwise small, small tofi would be formed. And one satellite patient is coming to us with a big tofi, you know. So it's right. better to work it up and every reason has got an answer. So this hyperuricemia always has got an answer. And by this evening, we are so much exposed about what are the different reasons for hyperuricemia. I'm very much sure about the, 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 you know, the viewers will be able to find out what is the reason for hyperuricemia and then to take care of it. All right. Uh, Dr. Abhay, would you like to respond towards basic pathogenesis as you have rightly said that 10 milligram, uh, 10, uh, in, uh, what do you say, uh, 10 milligram per dilution remaining there for so many years may not produce gout. So how do you respond to this question that hyperuricemia will require ma uh, uh, therapeutic management? The basic thing that we need to identify is that uh, the most important thing is that the individual symptoms is essentially a statement of the immune reaction of the host to the MSU crystal deposits. Now, that immune reaction, one, it is overwhelmed and there is a, a triggering of the acute phase and it goes into a chronic phase with the recurrent recurrence and chronicity and that is why we say it is an autoimmunity because it's, it is self-expressing, uh, uh, it is self-processing and it is self-secreting. So if the patient is symptomatic, we need to treat it. And if the patient is into a, a phase where they are into a silent hyperuricemia, then also 
we need to understand that not all uh, silent hyperuricemias can be left alone because there are certain genetic predispositions which we are not very clearly aware of as of now. And once the understanding is better, some of these hyperuricemias, silent hyperuricemias also need to be treated. Right. So, so Mohit, yes, you, you wanted to conclude, please. Your concluding sentence, you were trying to say something more? Dr. Abhay, Dr. Abhay. Oh, okay. Yeah, so essentially, treat all symptomatic hyperuricemias. Be aware if a patient has silent hyperuricemia. We do not know enough which silent hyper hyperuricemias to treat, but the disease is best treated till it's uh, uh, best treated uh, when the radiological footprint is the least. So that is of primary importance. Once the damage is done to the joint, then we are looking at salvage options. Right. So finally, there is a shift from no treatment to asymptomatic hyperuricemia to treating them after thoroughly investigating them so that they do not get converted into gout or other systemic diseases like cardiac involvement, etc. Is that right? So with these sentences and Dr. Mohit, if I understand it clearly, there are mentions by 2020 American College of Rheumatology now emphasizing that hyperuricemia, even though asymptomatic, may, may be treated therapeutically. So with these words, now I will again first welcome uh, our respected member, Dr. Tiwari, and request him to say a vote of thanks. Quick one. Good evening, everybody. And thank for the God Crystal Arthropedic Talk. Uh, we have been listening to Dr. Ramesh Sen. Naveen Thakka, Banak Bhushan De Devedi, Jasa Avana, Dr. Manish Khanna, Dr. Ra Raja, Dr. Sahesa, Abhay Alayalayang, and Dilip Majumna, and Akko Mohit Arora. So, today, we had the, the galaxy of all the stars sitting at one place and discussing the very difficult task and making the thing simple for the common man. Now we know the, some basic thing, where to operate, where to start the medicine, and now well, how we have to proceed. Thank you. Thank you for providing a space and thank you to IO for today's meeting. Okay. On my behalf also, I thank all the learned speakers, our faculty members, for being present throughout, which is the demand of any such Hello. teaching program. Hello. Now, I would like our convener, Dr. D.P. Bhusan, to conclude and end this session. It was a very enlightening session and many myths busted, many confusions solved with a surgical input when orthopedic surgeon supervenes over the rheumatologist. Now we have made it amply clear that it has to be an orthopedic surgeon to treat the joint problems than to be a plain rheumatologist. And that has been our goal. All the speakers have done the things beautifully. Dr. Majumdar and Dr. Tiwari has concluded well. And we are very thankful that from the Halong Bay of Ho Chi Minh City, the natural wonder of the world, our Ramesh Sen has also joined. Thank you very much. The team Thank is closed. You. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, bye, -bye. bye. Good night, everybody. And Thanks we'll so meet good. in Calcutta. Next time we'll meet in Calcutta next month. Yes. Any announcement, Professor Manish? So, uh, to all... Uh,